So I want to go quickly through domestic stuff. Um, and this is pretty basic, but uh, a very handsome character here who's uh, got a uh, galvanised iron roof behind him, pretty normal stuff. It's good. It's a good system. Galvanised iron's fine. Colour bond is fine. If you're going to live down by the coast, you want colour bond ultra because it's even finer. It will actually last uh, as long as perhaps your solar panels rather than you having to re-roof your house which involves tearing all the solar panels down. And so think about roofing materials. I, uh, we build, build a lot of structures and uh, uh, you can see that I love playing with water. And what I'm actually just hugging there is uh, a first flow um, director. So it's, it's saying uh, Graham doesn't want the magpie poo off the roof and so that's going to waste. And it's just that first, you know, might be 40 litres or something off the roof uh, that, that takes the water to stormwater. That doesn't mean it's com completely useless or anything, it just means it's not going into my tank. Um, now in terms of tanks, uh, poly uh, is great. Um, looking at all of the RM RMIT uni results, um, poly came out on top, apart from stainless steel. If you want to be spending a few million dollars on a water tank, go for it. But um, it's, it's good enough for me. And um, I guess uh, the, the one bogey that still sort of sits in there a lot is the PVC pipes and um, quite often you have flooded pipes where the water is accumulated on the roof, it's going down into the ground and then under the ground and then up and into the tank and that means the, the water has resided in the PVC for a while. Candidly, uh, I'm not concerned, um, but uh, you know there, there's always a, a few questions over the stabilisers that have been used in the in that plastic. Okay, um, so one of my favourite things is, is translucent roofs, and so you've got a darkish spot, you've got a spot that you really want it to feel like it's outdoors, um, and you're not keen on skin cancer, so. Um, polycarbonate becomes a bit of an interest. Obviously, you could do it in glass, but polycarbonate's, you know, really easy for a do-it-yourself kind of person. Um, and the water resides on it only very briefly, uh, and it's a, a magnificent kind of material to work with. Uh, all right, it's an industrial product, but we love it, and we've incorporated it into a lot of structures, and it gives you that freedom from ultraviolet radiation, and you can also get it with... Um, uh, a capacity to reflect most of the heat. So get most of the light, reflect most of the heat. So very good value. Um, if, you, if you're a bit scum, uh, you can just go for a bamboo roof. Um, we could do that, we grow bamboo. So, you know, m billions of other people use bamboo for roofs. Um, let's go on to gutterless roofs. And you think, oh, you're wasting the water, you're wasting the water, but not if it's a rain garden. Come and come and look at my rain garden. Dribble, dribble, glub, 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 croak, 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 croak. And, and so you've really made the most of the rainfall. And so your house is here and you've got your, your little um, roof, extra translucent, sorry, gutterless roof here. And so the garden it's dribbling onto is getting maybe three times as much rainwater as it would otherwise have. And so you can suddenly grow all these exotic, South American tropical plants and all sorts of um, things that you, you only had dreamt of and, and yet you, you've done it and it, it, it looks absolutely fantastic. This, this little garden here was built actually where a rotten horrible track was and, uh, and that's the power of rainwater. Now, trying to minimise the infrastructure in permaculture designs um, we thought, bugger it, we'll, we'll put a reverse slope on this particular structure. So it's a, a sheltered structure with polycarbonate top and grapevines under the poly and, this, and, and it slopes back to the house gutter. So we're not losing the water and we are gaining the rain. And we ended up with um, a gorgeous little space now, retrofitting gutters and so forth, so in the refugee camps, uh, I don't know, the, most of the organisations, you would have thought that they'd woken up to the fact that they've got about bloody 50 hectares of tents out there and they could be collecting their own water, but you know, the tents inevitably are not made with gutters. And so these, these guys um, 
actually designed a uh, lash it on gutter. Uh, and uh, so quickly retrofit, also got a, a bit of a filter so you don't get um, leaves and stuff in the water and, and then you can catch it through those other gizmos. And I, I just love this little exercise here. <laughs> when, when all else fails, steal a piece of plastic and uh, set up your own water collection arrangement. Um, and, and then um, we're all very slack when it comes to gutter guards. But it's well worthwhile because once you get leaves and you know gum nuts and crap in your gutter, it, it slows everything down, it chocks it up, it begins to ferment, it, it discolours your water, it could you know, have a funny taste. Why not just try to get rid of most of that stuff before it ever actually gets into the gutter? Um, and, uh, and, and that's a, a really se sexy system, that one there. Okay, well you, if you have an average house in Adelaide, can catch all the water you need to live on. Um, and so if we say that we start with um, a 300 square metre area, which would be 250 square metres for the house and 50 for a garage, workshop, whatever it might be, um, and you're living in the city of Adelaide, um, you're going to have your 160 kilolitres per year, uh, and you could dispose of that in, in this way, uh, 120 to the house, okay, so you've got a tank full of water and the little pump down here, it switches on and you bathe yourself and so forth. Uh, you clean your teeth, more water. Here comes the water, the water's just coming into the reed bed. Um, so it's gone through the first cycle. Oh, wait a minute, someone just flushed a dunny. Uh, that's gone in too. So this is grey and black water and, uh, and then that can go uh, through the reed bed and out to your orchard. So yes, you've caught it and you've used it and you've used it again. So it's like a magic pudding. Um, now we've got a little bit of uh, water for a vegetable garden as well. That's just straight rain water. So this is not, we're not putting Nasty, nasty grey water or black water on our veggies. No, 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 no. Um, and then you've got a little bit spare. Um, you know, like say you get a really long dry spell or um, you, you need a bit of a fire reserve. You've, you've got that spare. So that actually works and we have done it. Uh, we've done it for long periods of time with four people living in our house. Um, and I can attest to it. I'm still here and I'm still alive. I'm talking to you. And the question then is, how big a tank do I need to actually make that work you know, so that I can actually get and use all of the water that fell on my roof? And the answer is you use some sort of a tankulator, uh, could be an app on the web or it could be um, a, a, a nice kind of thing that I can read, uh, which is a graph produced by uh, SA Water and it, 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 it gobbles up all of the rainfall data or the average rainfall data for South Australia and so you're using some of the water but you're also catching some of the water so it's coming through the tank. You don't have a tank that can catch 160 kilolitres. You have a tank that lets 160 through and uh, this is meant to work to 90% water security so there could be the odd day where you don't get a shower or something um, and we can all handle that. So um, I, you know, I'm not saying just rip your mains taps out, the infrastructure's there, good oh, it's uh, there for an emergency or an expansion of your garden or whatever. You can see that tank's actually been set into the ground a little bit and it's meant that we could get more water storage under the height of the gutter and it means that the water in the bottom of the tank is underground and therefore cool. So um, it's a big help. Um, so that's a 20,000 litre one and the way this thing works is, um, okay, I've got a 450 millimetre rainfall, I come up here, I meet something that down here says I've got a 250 square metre roof, I draw that up to there and that up to there and I read off how big a tank I want for 90%. So very, very straightforward. Now, this reed bed thing, um, I know some people are really suspicious of them, but it's, it's pretty basic. 
you, you flush your toilet um, uh, here um, and it goes in, into there and then flows through this reed bed which cleans the water up, ends up in a little tank and a pump automatically turns on when there's say 100 litres in there and pushes it out to your orchard. But it's, it's very, very straightforward. Um, and uh, as I'm claiming there, 10 to 20 fruit trees. Um, and if you want to have a big variety, you can actually sort of, um, you know, prune your trees so that you can have more trees but smaller trees and, and still get away with it. Now, the first thing that that water went into after it left the house was a septic tank. Um, and uh, it's got the role, effectively, of slowing the water right down and letting gravity uh, sink sand and crap to the bottom, so gravity. And then it's got this huge microbial community, billions and billions of little microbes there sort of waiting for the turds to come down the PVC pipe and yummy, yummy, yummy in my tummy. And, um, and they just, they tear it to pieces. And uh, so it's, uh, it, it's quite spectacular. So it's pretty much an anaerobic thing. Um, and so it does come out as a slightly smelly, cloudy water. Um, and uh, it's not something you would want your children to play in or anything like that. Um, and, and so, but it's terribly, terribly important because, you know, that cloudy water, um, it, it's, it's going to block up your irrigation if you try to put it through. And, and uh, so y it needs to get cleaner. And uh, it also could be carrying a lot of nasty little bacteria and protozoa and other things. So the reed bed is just a plastic tub, normally a, a, a poly tub, that is 600 deep or thereabouts, and it's filled up with gravel, say 20 mil gravel, and uh, the water just flows through and then into the, uh, the, the, whoops, the sump, which is there. Here it goes. And it doesn't smell, it's clear. Um, it's been, I guess, helped out in terms by the reeds of the bubbling of the air from the roots of the reeds in the water, which is oxygenating and purifying. Um, and so you're getting oxidation and you're also getting a sanitation happening quite, a, quite effective. Um, we've got different uh, types of reeds that we can use. Um, and needless to say, um, the most effective one that we could find is Nile grass, which is of course a an invader, um, but bloody hell, it's uh, very, very winter active, whereas if you use, try to use a lot of the native stuff, they kind of shut down a bit, and, and bulrushes and things like that are, are hopeless. So uh, for the purists, use sedges, um, and uh, for those who want uh, like dynamic action, uh, I, I recommend the cypress. Um, that's how you can propagate the Bulrushes, for instance, you could just go and get the head off a bulrush, just rip its head off, and then spread its seed into a styrene floating in another styrene with a bit of potting mix, and bugger me, the next thing you've got thousands and thousands of little baby reeds. So it's not actually all that hard. Now, okay, some people want to actually grab their grey water, so that's the stuff from the shower and uh, the washing machine and so forth. A a and, and some seem keen to put the kitchen sink on as well. I kind of counsel against that a bit because kitchen sinks carry a lot of oils and, uh, and that can clog your fairly primitive system up. Whereas your grey water, or your black water system, the reed bed system will, will handle it without any trouble at all. So really um, this, this thing, the grey water system, A, theoretically you have to have something co council approved or state health department approved. B, it's gonna cost you a heap. Um, and uh, did, 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 you, did you really wanna do it? Wouldn't it be just easier to have a reed bed? So if you can have a reed bed, I'd have a reed bed. Oh, yeah, but look, I put a reference in there. So if you're looking back on this online when you go back to review the conference, uh, Michael Mobb's amazing place in the middle of bloody Sydney uh, and he, he just uh, cycles everything and he just does impossible things with water. So 
the basic system I've explained, <laughs> poof, that's nothing compared with the magic that he can do um, with uh, wastewater. Now, if you've got quite a bit of wastewater, you, know, you might have a dairy, oh no, um, a dairy or something, um, you've got a lot of, a lot of organic matter in the, in, the, in the water. This thing just like rips the organic matter out of it because it's the, the, f the flow form, the form is, is, is really blending that water and the air and it does a terrific job. Um, okay, there was one last bit there, of the water that you got off the roof, which was uh, for firefighting and uh, irrigation. And I just pretty much assume I'm putting on about 75 centimetres on every metre of my garden if you want to calculate how much that is and how much of your tank water that would represent. Now, what about not using water? <laughs> Composting toilets. Um, so reading permaculture daily, uh, this is a good guy and uh, he's just contributed splash free uh, his little offering for the day and uh, he's chucked down a, a handful of wood uh, pairings or wood shavings which will integrate with the human manure and urine and produce a beautiful black gold. Uh, a, a compost you'd be happy to eat if you n didn't know where it came from. Um, but, but, uh, but nevertheless, uh, and that, that we can do things with, but, but we, we also have uh, water coming from that building because you have to have hand basins and we happen to have a shower in there as well. And that goes through a reed bed system, a baby, baby reed bed system and produces all of our bamboo. So works well. This is the gear that sort of you're mucking around with when you've done your business and uh, months or so later you decide, hey, there's not too many people around using the, the toilet system. We'll just close it down for a day and uh, clean her out. Um, so lovely, lovely stuff. Must be buried about 10 centimetres underground. And so if you've got a tree here, you just make a little hole around the drip line and um, Bob's your uncle. It's the best fertiliser ever. Now, this is, this is a very young Marty Freeney, uh, evil boy. Uh, he was just building a, a, um, uh, a composting toilet that was probably not in the slightest bit legal. Um, but hey, what a, what a great thing to do. And um, it's the batching kind of approach. And most people would know this as the nature loo type. And so you let people fill it up and then you wheel it away. Uh, and popped out in the sun and it cooks for a while and then you use it, uh, of course, burying the <coughs> proceeds under your fruit trees or your ornamental trees or whatever. Um, and you've got a, another willy bin which you've quickly popped in before the next customer comes in uh, and the process continues in that sort of rotational manner. Now, some other little domestic water strategies, the use of micro ir irrigation obviously is going to save water rather than sprinkling stuff violently on uh, 40 degree days. Uh, growing food forests, which have got multiple layers, so this layer gets shaded by that layer, gets shaded by that layer, and a whole lot of moisture is recirculated within the food forest. And so you, although you're putting a fair bit of water on, uh, you are actually getting a lot of produce for your water. Um, then training and pruning, and then shade and shelter, which are just critical. Um, and I claim that in an ordinary year, uh, you will be way ahead with 50% shade. So it's quite extreme when you think about it, just I'm cutting out 50% of my sunshine. So, ne so next, well, well, later this year when El Nino comes, you'll, you'll wish you had some shade. Um, and La Nina, 50% was too much shade. So, bugger, I don't know. Um, so th then we've got uh, the use of outbuildings. Now, let's get my little pointer here. So you've got a little composting toilet building. It's not a very big roof. Is it really worth keeping that, that, that water? Yes, it is, because there's a tank just here and it sits well above the level of the teaching centre. So we've got gravity feed of rainwater. 
very quick, very easy, all done during the build. And uh, so that was one sexy little micro system. And then uh, here we've got um, an old, it's a stripper shelter actually. It's, it's not, a, not a shelter for human strippers. It's, uh, it has a machine in it that used to be called a stripper. It's a harvester. Um, and uh, it's old, uh, 1902. Um, so we've got a gutter along here, and then we've got these pickle barrels, these guys here, and the top one's getting the water from the roof, and then it just goes zooming down here, and it goes around on that contour, and so irrigating all those fruit trees. Hey, it's in addition to the normal irrigation system, but hey, why not? Yeah, give someone something to do. It's only a matter of a few minutes. Uh, well, there's yeah, a couple of approaches to shade and shelter. Um, the, the one on the right will, will, will protect you from birds. It'll, it'll uh, look after hail and protect, protect you, your stuff from hail. Um, it, it'll protect you from frost. Um, and all of these things are big worries if you're trying to produce a food crop that you rely on for your income. Okay, so you can also choose very, very water efficient plants. And so something like a pistachio, it looks like it's almost coated with a, a wax to conserve the moisture that the, that the plants got from the ground. And uh, you can see a uh, very young Hannah Maloney there. Yes. <laughs> this guy here, He's well over six feet. <laughs> so you choose your harvesters as sustainable harvesters as well. Mm. <laughs> this is um, my daughter's driveway in Amarina Court in Hobart. Um, but what they did was, well, Jared is always farting around with angle grinders and things. He angle ground this micro irrigation channel and then led the uh, runoff out into the spots where they now have a whole lot of hazelnuts and all sorts of things absolutely thriving. So, you know, you can be very, very small scale and then you go out, every time you go out in the car, you think, yes, yes, yes! And, uh, yeah. and this is uh, a lot more work. Um, this is in the Canary Islands where they're using shaping of the ground and also rock mulch. Uh, and most of the water actually comes from the sea fogs that roll in um, and condense on the rocks, and, and, and that's basically all the water these grapevines get. Then there's the good old straw bale. You know, you, you want to slow that water down, just whack in a straw bale and you'll, you'll start to get it under control so you're not getting erosion, particularly on new sites and so forth. And if you've got a, a serious slope, you, you really need, need to, to terrace. So uh, um, the, uh, the Italians and the, and the Greeks have known that for a long time. Now, you've got Ego in the audience, but he can tell you about a million times more than me about this, but um, let's say we have um, a, little, a little village. It's just kind of tiny, just two little huts, and so the water falls up on the high hill up here, and then it runs down, um, and everything's fine. And then a few more people come along, and uh, then some of the trees go west, and um, the water's not actually infiltrating so well. And so what, what, what they've done is they've just simply dug themselves a bloody great trench or a pond and lo and behold the water actually coming down here and off the village tends to get absorbed and then through it goes and, and here by here is thinking, ooh, you know, it's quite a bit lower, I might just come out of the ground here. So that's a natural spring and they've put a collector here, and lo and behold, a little pipe coming out here, and it's dribbling down into a collection vessel where people can just go and get their water. And so, um, a, a fantastic and very, very effective thing that delivers dividends within a year of installation. And it also keeps these little buggers interested in you know, working rather than playing all the time, or listening to ego singing. Um, and. Uh, here we've got uh, a Vietnamese model where you've got this overland flow, uh, which um, it's got a probably a bit better silk, funny, beautiful. Um, 
a, a bit of a bit of gunge in it. It's come through an orchard, and so it's uh, maybe a, a bit a bit grotty, um, and so it's gone into um, a, a concrete vessel, probably. Um, and at the bottom, they've got quite big rocks and grading down to small gravel and finally sand. And so the water that goes in is largely uh, going to be first filtered by the sand. So the grubby stuff will end up in the sand. And you can actually say, uh, Johnny, I want you to go and clean the sand out and get some new sand in. Uh, so a regular job, but not so onerous. It's not like you're asking little Johnny to go and get the boulders out of the bottom. And, and so it's a, a good filtration mechanism for fairly large uh, quantities of water and also something that's you know, quite resilient in an agricultural environment. And then the, the water is just going down um, from, from there into an existing well. So that's a very direct kind of recharge of a well, uh, which could be just simply equipped with a, a basic pump or you could have windlasses or whatever it might be. This is starting to get a bit more complicated. This is where you're sort of tangling with rivers and reservoirs and so on, and you can see the, the basic river coming. It's been dammed up, and they can actually run some water out uh, straight from the reservoir. Um, then they've got uh, here uh, a, a, a pretty basic sort of a off-river off irrigation system, another off-river irrigation system. Um, and here, more interestingly, the water's coming down here and you've actually said um, we're going to uh, divert some of it. So you've just made a structure so you can grab some of that water. Um, and, and, and so it's getting to be sort of a scale where permaculture people start to need a few engineers uh, floating around and they're usually happy to do it. So this is a magnificent uh, painting done by a very famous artist. Uh, the Barossa Valley is out here, and this is uh, South Para Reservoir. They meet in Gawler, um, and they flow past the food forest, and uh, we uh, have essentially uh, forever kind of had this ancient steel tank, and that got filled with water from roofs and so forth, and then we would occasionally pump up from the Gawla River and fill that, and then that would go off out to the trees. But the river is pretty buggered, and so it'll often have water in it that's it's toxic at 7,000 parts per million salt. Um, and so you have to be like really, really careful, and um, you, know, you, you only had limited opportunities to do that because the river would flow out to sea and you'd lost your opportunity, etc. But we did that um, and then thought, oh, well, maybe we can, you know, be a bit more business like this uh, with, with this. And, um, and, and, and we, we, we really thought hard, long and hard, about the importance of the quality of the water. And so here you can see that the plants below the 850 milligrams per litre, which is parts per million. Uh, that's where most of the things are, aren't they? There's bugger all up there. So let's say we, we want all of our water to be at least that good and, and know that if, if we let the salt sneak you know, up too high, like above <laughs> oh, there, um, we, 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 oh, sorry, that was back to the front. Yeah, so we can grow all of those things at the top and we don't want to particularly grow things right down the bottom. And so um, you've got the salinity side of things and then you've got contamination, uh, could be chemicals, could be um, living things, turbidity, that's you know the, the cloudiness and, uh, and the pH, the acidity of the water. They're the critical kind of measures. Um, so what we decided we, we would actually put in a bore and go down to the aquifer underneath our place and uh, so that we could actually expand our plantings with some sort of confidence that we could get water all year round. Um, but uh, it was pretty good in the beginning, but uh, after you know, sort of 10 years it was pretty bad. Um, and that's really um, the story of 
uh, groundwater in Australia, but particularly in South Australia, like it's, it's going to hell. And, uh, and like climate change is just making that happen faster and faster. So that's the graph of you know, uh, salt uh, sort of rising there on, on that bore. Uh, dry land salting here, you know, leaf burn and, and actual fruit damage. So we've, we've actually pulled all of our, all of our uh, pretty much all of our apples out as a result of uh, the decline in the quality of, of that water. But we were still determined that we would try to use the river and uh, so um, like little commandos, we will we'll go down there and get this pump going and we'll pump the water that's good uh, up into, um, uh, into, into the aquifer or into the irrigation tank. Um, and and it's, it's really improved the place enormously. Um, so we, we've been able to put very good river water into the not so good groundwater, which means that it's been shandied and it's all now pretty good groundwater. Um, so uh, we, we live happily ever after. Um, but uh, there's a lot of work to do, um, and some of this might horrify those of you who like you know, sort of alternate technologies and uh, doing things simply. Um, so first we settle the water in a pond, and that drops out the sand and silt and so forth. And then we bash it through a sand filter, like a giant swimming pool filter. And then finally, uh, we put it through an ultra filter, which is sort of like an RO unit, but um, not, not nearly so fine. So it's, it's not taking the salt out, it's just taking, oh, coronavirus, for instance. And so the Environment Protection Authority tells us how clean the water has to be to go into the groundwater. And, uh, and so we, we get monitored. They can see what our system is doing anytime they like on the, on the web. Um, and uh, it's a very severe kind of requirement in terms of uh, excellence. But um, yeah, we can do that. And you can see the difference between slightly cloudy water and um, really, really super clean water. And that water gets stored in this big tank and then uh, injected down the purple pipe um, and so the only thing driving the water down into the aquifer is the height of the water in the tank. Um, there's no pumping involved in, in that uh, and the pumping generally for the whole system is done using solar power. Well okay so we've now got the water down in the ground and so next summer we say Woohoo, time to start the irrigation um, and uh, at that stage we actually pump out of another bore which is over here so the, the water's gone down and it's mixed up and then it's come across and now we've got it from this bore and that is what we use for actual irrigation. <sighs> this is a different project and I've just really really got to put on the speed here this is the Clifford Road drain. This is a crappy concrete drain running down Clifford Road. Uh, and you can see it gets quite excited on occasions. And if you had a really good day, enough water goes down that drain to irrigate our farm for a year. That's, it, is, it is huge. And uh, so it looks like a miserable little drain, but it carries a huge amount of, of water. And um, we, 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 we sort of... Uh, really hankered after that water because that water comes from the roofs and the roads and the driveways of the lovely people of Gawler and it's absolutely pure, it's beautiful. Um, well, in terms of salt, it's not so pure in terms of maca wrappers, but um, really it's, uh, it, it's, it's a really, really important resource and there's a hell of a lot of water that goes down, down the gurgler. So we're talking about 90 to 100 million litres per year just going off into the, into the the river and you might say oh but the poor river now wait a minute this this stuff was collected by the town and uh you know so it's it's actually different and it's kind of not as good as the rainwater that would have landed uh and where does it go anyway it goes <laughs> out to you know, out into the sea um at virginia so uh we only take a tiny tiny percentage of it um or we don't yet because we haven't done it but we're going to so there's an off take there so that's where we ambush the water we run it into a silt trap that drops out the sand. We have it in a storage pond and we 
drive the water out around a wetland, gradually cleaning it, and then finally it comes all the way back down and goes into the aquifer recharge scheme. So, oh, what have I got? Ten. Oh my God. Um, we're just about there. Um, so, so this is um, uh, Garner Park. It's um, down just south of, of, of us here and organised by Salisbury Council. And they, uh, they really use uh, nature to clean up their water. They have, I think, 600 clients who buy water from them that has been retrieved from stormwater drains. You know, big, big industrial uh, operators, public parks, schools, etc., etc. So it's a big show. But this is the sort of thing that you can have, you know, like you are actually in a beautiful environment and it's benefiting the, the whole ecosystem and the groundwater system and there's just no downside. Um, so that's what we're trying to sort of emulate, but, but we want to be jet powered. We want to be better because we're permies. And um, so do the job faster and uh, so on. This is another really sneaky one that I tried. This was just, you know, nothing to do. Uh, bit of a hole in the ground over there. Jeez, it never fills up with water, that hole, does it? No, no. Oh, Martin's Dam over the road doesn't fill up with water ever, does it? Yeah, no, no. Two days and it's all gone, every drop. I thought, there's got to be an aquifer down there. It can't be far down. It's all escaping. And so, uh, given that we had the hole and we had an excavator that happened to be kicking around, I said, just dig a bit deeper. And uh, sure enough, you know, four or five dig big scoops and bang, up comes a scoop full of beautiful, you know, coarse yellow sand. And I was there, yeah, et cetera. And, uh, and the excavator thought, oh, shit, I've hit a pipe. Oh, no. Uh, but, uh, and so it's just a bit of an old concrete pipe. This thing here is just a bit of old concrete pipe and it, we, we bedded it down onto these rocks in that sandy layer and then we built up um, a sort of filtration layer around it. We made sure that this was really, really sealed and so the water that comes in from the river can get build up, build up, build up and eventually overflow through... Well, actually, it's Anna Marie's old hammock is one of the things, but there's quite a lot of other things that participate in that multi-dimensional filter. And, uh, and so the water just goes zooming off. And, you know, uh, up over here, we've got our pistachio trees, and they'll go down 30 metres looking for water. So there is no ifs or buts. It, it's working uh, and cost bugger all. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going into competition where they go. Um, now, that's not very, not very glamorous, is it? <laughs> that's all you see. <laughs> if you saw it today, there'd be a few sheep there as well, just to make it a bit more exciting. Now, the Indians, they've been doing this for thousands of years, and, and then they got onto bores. And so, so they had these tanks, which were just like a dam, and then they would be used for farm use. And they noticed that around the dams, there was uh, really good growth. Um, but then when the people started putting in bores, um, they sort of said, oh, these, these tanks, yeah, too much hard work. You know, they fill up with silt and you've got to maintain them. And, uh, and, and then they, they realised that um, the tanks were gone. There was no infiltration. There was no water in the bloody bores anymore. And so, no, we're talking hundreds of thousands of bores just went dry. And it was, it was really, really sad. Um, and, uh, and then... Uh, I don't know who really thought of it first, but there is a guy called the, the water warrior, Ayapa Masagi, and he went forth and he proselytised. And so essentially you've got here um, a bore. Um, now the ground level is you know, above this guy's cap, so the, bore le bo the, the uh, ground level's here somewhere and the bore's coming out there and the water gets pumped up there. But they said, no, no. We're going to bore a whole lot of holes, little holes. We're going to wrap it up really well with a whole lot of filters, like you know, mosquito mesh kind of stuff. And, uh, and so then we can introduce a, a, a great slab of filtration material, which would be, again, the gravel, the sand, da-da-da-da-da. And um, 
and then we can flood it. We can flood it inside a dam. And so this thing is sitting there, a bore with holes in the top, sitting in a dam with a filter on top of it. And so the water in the dam just gradually infiltrates directly into the aquifer. So that's, um, that's the bore well for percolation. And that is now absolutely on fire in, uh, in India. It's just uh, wonderful. And this is, uh, you can see how much, how much labor they can get and all that, all that rock work. Oh man, you couldn't do that in a million years here. Um, but that's the structure. And, 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 and this is kind of what, what, what it looks like um, inside. So inside this structure, you look down and there's the old bore going down and blub, 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 it's filling the, the goodies up. Now, Aussies, well, uh, we, I'm, I must have been just about there, aren't I? Two minutes? Right, three minutes then, questions, and you know, then I'll get off your back. Um, so, there's lots and lots and lots of farms that uh, have had dams in Australia. So like the Indians, they've given up on them because we've got more evaporation and we've got less rain and we've got uh, just uh, altogether all uh, an expectation that um, our livestock would have water in every paddock on every farm. And so they've put in expensive mains water connections, a lot of them don't really work all that well, uh, and it costs an arm and a leg to get a, an extra mains connection. So some bright guys in the southeast said, look, uh, we're gonna have a go at this uh, trick that the mining industry's been using for years, which is to establish dams on construction sites out in arid areas and put in a plastic uh, area which sheds all of the water into some sort of a catchment and then that can be used. Now, do you see a big disadvantage of that compared with the system that I described, well, a couple of systems I've described in the last few minutes? Yes, 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 yes. And so, um, you know, shit of a system really, um, but you know, if there's no alternative, it, it, it does work. And, uh, and this is um, uh, a system which, it was done many, many years ago on Boston Island out in the middle of Port Lincoln Harbour with this high density poly uh, film and then um, a, a dam down the bottom and that great big windmill would just pump all of the water up to the top of the hill to this huge uh, gang of, of tanks. And so the water could be uh, gravitated down to all of the livestock. Um, troughs around uh, around the, the property. So, really great system. This is a bit of a ooh, weird one. I don't know how many people from our natural resource management boards are here, but anyway, this nat natural resource management board, which is on Kangaroo Island, um, let um, my mate <laughs> Dan Paddingale reshape what was an old olive orchard. Yep, and uh, it it kind of uh, sheds water very, very systematically down a pretty well grassed uh, thingo and it ends up um, with his uh, beautiful fig orchard. And uh, so if you buy um, sticky figs from Foodland, they come from that place and it's a bit of water magic that's gone on. Oh, how, can I just do just a tiny bit more? Swales, I, I hate it how permaculturists are being sucked into this contour banks business and, and swales. They shouldn't be on the contour. You don't want to have a swale on a contour. You want to have it off contour just slightly. So if there's an awful lot of rain, it spills onto a grass waterway. So I know it buggers up a whole lot of the systems that have been promoted, but uh, if you want your swale to survive and not start another gully, um, just put a bit of a fall on your swales. There you have a classical contour system with a grass waterway. Um, I have to mention key lime because it's part of our religion. Uh, and it doesn't work much in South Australia, but if you do get a key lime plough or, or an agro plough and you plough parallel to the key line, you will drive water out to your ridges and take it away from your gullies. 
so you'll get much more pasture or crop growth. This is uh, natural sequence farming, the maniac Peter Andrews that blocked up all of his creeks and so forth and um, established all sorts of wetlands um, and now it's, it's a huge thing. They got, I don't know, many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars anyway from the government anyway to do this, which was such a fantastic scheme. Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm done just about there. <laughs> this is how much water you need. This is how you can measure it. Um, and um, there's got to be, there's got to be more. You, you've got to plan for floods. You need your biodiversity. All these animals depend on water and uh, you will end up happily ever, ever after. And thank you very much. And I hope you have happy <laughs> water. Thank you, Graham. I'm a huge fan of nominative determinism and somehow I knew a water presentation by somebody with Brookman as a surname was going to be fabulous. Can we please give it up, please, for Graham Brookman.